Welcome back everybody, Conrad's Corner. Thank you very much for joining us. Really, really excited today. Big, big time guest for us today. Arguably uh, the king of the hospitality brand, Recipe Unlimited, Mark Eaton, Chief Development Officer? Yes, correct. Wonderful. Please, uh, for the guests and the listeners and the viewers who don't know, tell us a little bit, well, I mean, I know it, Kara. So tell us a little bit about Recipe and the history. Oh yes, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, yeah, we're you know 130 plus year old company, so a ton of Canadian heritage. Actually, the oldest Canadian restaurant company by by a long shot, which is kind of cool. I'm pretty proud of that. I actually work for the Canadian company that's been around so long. Um, you know, we've come through quite a journey from selling apples and newspapers on the Canadian railways um, to where we are today, which is over 1,200 restaurants across 18 different brands. So, 1,200 restaurants. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Coast to coast, including, plus we have uh, uh, other international uh, holdings as well, and we have uh, restaurants in the U.S. As, as well today. So mostly domestic, but a little bit abroad too, which is kind of cool. So Certainly from an iconic Canadian brand, we, we know them well. We all know them. Canadian families know them. Swiss Chalet, Harvey's, The Keg. Uh, tell me about some of the newer ones. Yeah, so we, we purchased New York Fries probably about eight years ago now, seven or eight years ago. Been a great little acquisition for us. Really allowed us to kind of get into the Canadian mall footprint, which we didn't really have a, a great uh, presence in up to that point. Uh, and and we, you know, we love buying dominant brands uh, in their category. That's always what we look for, either new and up and coming or mature and dominant. Uh, you know, not just like with the St. Hubert purchase, extremely dominant in the Quebec market. Uh, you know, over 120 restaurants in one province is almost unheard of yeah. across the country, and they really own that market. So we're looking to add to our portfolio of brands. That's what we look for. Is it white space in our current network? Does it allow us to kind of reach into a different uh, type of asset base? And, you know, is it going to be creative for us? So talk to me a little bit about white space. When you say that, and for your brand, I mean, one of the things as an outsider and having been worked in the business for a little bit in, the, mm -hmm. in that space, uh, one of the things that we always heard about was the culture at recipe, the culture at recipe. So presumably you guys aren't just gonna go look and, and buy something or acquire something acquisition strictly from the numbers. It has to fit the culture? It has to fit the culture, really important, but really has to fit you know, what we're looking for from a, a plug and play perspective. We would never look to buy something that didn't have a really strong management team in place. We don't want to buy and strip out. We want to buy, uh, leverage all that institutional knowledge that got the brand to where it is today and just make it even bigger and better. Right. So this isn't like like a Star Trek reference. This isn't like the Borg where they just get acquired and they're assimilated in and that's it. You're part, you're part of the collective. You really hang on to the nucleus of the brand? We try desperately to hang on to the nucleus because that's part of the secret sauce, right? So yeah. to speak, it really is. Brands don't get created without something special about them that, you know, the people that work there love, the people that, you know, use the brand love. I think the best example of that is the keg in Canada. Definitely. There's something about the keg that just resonates with, with every, every you know, type of touch point. It's the server you know, uh, engagement. It's the guest love. It's the place where you go to celebrate amazing things in your life, right? Uh, that anniversary, the birthday, the, the, you know, the retirement, whatever it is, every Canadian can think back to an experience of the keg and go, I have special special time there. I recall for that reason. Yeah, right? everybody everybody has a keg moment. Everybody, yeah. I mean, for me, uh, the thing that I think of the keg so vividly is just it's so consistent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't even think of a bad experience I had at the keg. It's always consistent. They always yeah. hit the mark. How is that that you guys are able to do that, to deliver that consistency in that brand for this long? First and foremost, you know, you know great recruitment, uh, passion uh, around training and delivering that excellence. You know, we, talk, we call them keggers, you know, the employees <laughs> of the restaurant. They, it's a bit of a cultural thing for them. They, they want to be there. They want to be, they're looking to deliver that amazing experience. It's part of what they want to do and be there for that reason. Um, and the keg has a really cool e expression, which is uh, we need to be the best when we're at our worst. So it's all about recover, guest recovery. So you'll never leave the four walls of a keg restaurant. Something very rarely goes wrong without them fixing it above and beyond your expectations. Right? And that's what brings yeah. people back. That's what makes people talk about it. 
uh, makes it a you know this this great institutional brand in Canada. Absolutely right. I mean, we'll get into COVID in a yeah. little bit, but I mean, I, I can tell you firsthand had a, an experience in the summertime. I guess a year ago now. And it was um, not the best experience, but I'll tell you, the manager came over and yeah. made it right. Yeah. And I think that's really indicative across all your your different brands that you have under the umbrella is that that culture is there and they really want to make sure that yeah. you're happy before you leave. I think people work so hard for that disposable amount of income they have in their wallet at the end of the month. They're very discerning about where they're going to spend it. Um, and we want them to choose us. And we want to work hard for them to choose us. It's a great point. And I mean... Um, it's 2023, the new year. We're talking a little bit about disposable income. You just mentioned that. What do you envision the restaurant specifically or the hospitality industry is going to look like this year in 2023? Yeah, I mean, we, we are very focused and, and very aware that it's it's not going to be easy out there for a lot of Canadians. Let's look at the interest rates and yeah. uh, housing costs and all the other inflationary pressures on the consumer spending. Um, we know we're gonna have to work hard to make them choose us when they do go out. The one that's great thing about the hospitality business is, you know, humans are generally very social. And you can't sit inside your home all the time and, and not have those social experiences. People wanna get together with friends, break bread, uh, celebrate things. We just wanna make sure that, you know, when they choose us to do those things, they're getting a great experience for a good value. Uh, and they're going to return because of those key things. That's really, really what is important. Service, ambiance, yep. and quality food with, with great value. It doesn't have to be cheap to be great value. It just has to be great value perceived by the guest. Yeah. And you guys have a number of different price points within your, your umbrella where yeah. if people need a lower price point, there's options there. Mid-level, um, I'm not sure. Do you, do you have one that would be considered a higher end, high price point? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly our, our beer market brand is a higher price point yep. because of the type of menu. Keg, we would consider a premium brand as well. The Landing Group is a premium brand yep. in, our, yep. in our world too. We don't have any, any necessarily white tablecloth type of diners, which I think is a good thing for us. We kind of we kind of really trying to track the average Canadian uh, to our restaurants, which is great. And Recipe and Cara historically always did quite well during recessionary, inflationary times because. We had a breadth of offering. Mm -hmm. So typically, if you were, you know, a loyal keg guest, and you know, it seems a little, little bit too pricey for where your wallet sits this month, you may trade down to Montana to get the same type of steak at a better price. Yeah. Or you know, trade from a Kelsey's to a Swiss, or a Swiss to a, a Harvey's. So we kind of get, you know, a little bit of balance there, which is great. And lots That's of a great thing about our company is we got a well balanced basket of offerings for all sorts of different price points and locations. Absolutely. It is great. Um, lots of options, lots of different availabilities. You mentioned about Canadians being social and people being social in general. Tell me, how did you guys handle when we weren't able to be social? When we weren't able to be social, we were dealing with COVID lockdowns. I'm, I'm fascinated the way the business and, and the industry, real estate itself, hospitality, malls, everything. How did you guys specifically handle those difficult times? Yeah, I mean, listen, our frontline employees did did all the heavy lifting. They were the ones that, you know, couldn't work from home, had to be in the restaurant, behind the scenes, preparing meals for takeout delivery. And they're the real heroes of the, of the day. They really are. You know, people like you and I could sit at home and do our office thing and try to add value where we could. But they're the ones that kind of bucked the trend and really made, made success happen uh, for our company, at least. Uh, and then we were actually very fortunate because we had a bit of a unique situation where we had um, a retail business. Mm -hmm. So we sold our food at grocery, which was great. Uh, we had a gift card business, a hard copy gift card and an e-card business. So you could actually send gifts back and forth and support family members that you couldn't see. Uh, and we had you know, a good uh, cross-section of brands that were, that were um, fast food type categories. So Harvey's with the drive-thru, uh, Burger's Priest, yep. All those kind of things that weren't locked down physically, people could still use in a normal kind of way through either takeout and delivery normal channels or through some of what we call the aggregators, the skips and Ubers of the world, which is great. Um, and then we got really creative in our marketing, right? How do you reach the guest that's no longer yeah. driving by you? Uh, is it you know TV? Is it social? So a lot of really strong media claims uh, and really tried to resonate with the people. At the keg as an example, this is a really cool story. Uh, they, they didn't their, their takeout business was almost negligible hmm. before the pandemic, right? You don't ever think about 
going to get a take on me of the keg and taking it home because part of the keg experience is enjoying it there. All right, a little bit dimmer lighting, nice glass of wine, the appetizer, the dessert. Um, so they really kind of, you know, put all the team together and we're really brainstorming. How do we, how do we resonate with our guests to, to do something unique and different? And they created what they called the celebration kit. I don't know if you've heard of this, but, or saw this. It, it was a bit of a, you know, whiteboard exercise in the boardroom and they thought they'd give it a try where you could um, actually get a, a keg meal unprepared, delivered to your house with instructions on how to cook it. Right, it comes comes with all the all the you know side dishes, steak, steak spice, uh, an instruction sheet of how to do it. So we became this kind of really cool social media thing, and we were shocked on the uh, on the you know, the success and the demand for that product sold out way faster than we thought we would, which is kind of cool. So if you're home with your family and you're trying to think of a great thing to engage people, it was a neat idea. Right. It was a great idea. Yeah. I actually uh, tried it with my wife for a yeah. date night and we're like, let's give it a shot. Yeah. You know, the social media grabbed our attention. We were looking for things to do. It was exciting, something to try. And uh, admittedly, I didn't probably do as good a job as the keg, yeah. but uh, it, it was a good effort on the scene. Yeah. And again, it was great. We had John Crombie on the show a couple shows ago and yeah. he was talking about good friend pivot. Of mine, John's, yeah, yeah, John's phenomenal. Long, my, one of my very first managers. And so we had a good catch up and the conversation around retail, having to pivot, uh, online curbside pickup. So we talked heavily about how they had to pivot. I guess that's a little bit what, what you're alluding to about the yeah. restaurants having to pivot. And then, you know, we had obviously on Swiss Chalet and St. Hubert and, you know, they were, you know, historically look back 20, 30 years when you got, think about getting food delivered to your home, it was, it was, you know, Chinese food, typically pizza delivery and Swiss Chalet or St. Hubert. Those were the three yeah. options. Yeah. No one else did it. So the, you know, the pandemic certainly, you know, catapulted that category ahead, but we had such a head start. We had our own drivers, we have an on, omni-channel system that we had in place where people could order our food and they've got to deliver to their house. So we had a, a you know, like a, on a hundred yard dash, we were 50 yards ahead of most. Amazing. Which, which was great. Yeah. Right? Uh, I know in that, in that world, a lot of people have been talking over the last couple of years about the presence of of the food delivery systems, the yeah. aggregators. So the skip the dishes, the uh, Uber Eats, et cetera, et cetera. You guys are working with them, but how how have you found it? Is it benefiting your business? Is it cutting in? Is it convoluted? We hear about some in the franchise world where I came from, some people, the margins aren't there, it's too expensive. Uh, what are your thoughts on on the delivery system? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, it, it's uh, one of those necessary evils of the business. Like it'd be, it'd be nice if we, if it was truly incremental, uh, to your business, you could see the benefit in that uh, on, on, a, on a larger scale. The challenge that most face, including us a little bit, is it does come at a, a cost in the other channel to the business. So yeah. some people just gravitate towards Uber or Skip because that's what they're used to with every other brand, kind of forgetting we have our own delivery side of the business. So they end up paying more, we end up paying more. So we should just educate them that there's a better way to do it. That'd be awesome. But you know, they were definitely a necessity during the pandemic. and. It's up to us to find out how to work with them yep. to make sure we're delivering great value in a timely way to our guests. That's the key. You think they're here to stay? I think there'll be consolidation. Yep. There, there, and I think there has to be. I look at every other industry that had you know disruptors mm -hmm. inserted into them. There's always consolidation that happens, right? Think about the travel industry as an example. It happened there. It'll happen here as well, I think. Uh, and then you never know, hopefully, I mean, uh, we don't want to see anything in terms of a monopoly, but if there is some sort of consolidation, maybe the costs come down a little bit, yeah. a little bit more affordable, yeah. working better with, with the brands. Um, well, I you... think it's connected a little bit to the, the thing we talked about earlier too, when, you know, when the consumer's looking at their wallet every month and going, yeah. like, I have a little bit, are you really going to trade, um, cost for convenience as often as you did before? I think there may be a bit of a different thought process there that, Maybe I'll I'll skip the convenience today. You know, get out of my condo, go get it myself, and save the ten bucks. Yeah, right. I hope that some of the mindset changes are going to happen. So I think that we need to find that point where it settles a little bit. Still a little bit messy coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, I agree. I think coming yeah. out of the pandemic, we're still a little bit in, in limbo, a little bit of that gray area. Um, presumably, and you tell me if I'm wrong, the numbers are not as great as they were before the pandemic in terms of in restaurant. Yep, they probably picked up. Um, what does it look like? Are they coming back? Are people coming back in droves? Yeah, droves, maybe not the right word. They are coming back. And it's very um, segmented based on market, which I find very interesting. You know, you would assume that the downtown cores are still 
don't have the same you know, level of, of um, populace in them today. We are seeing that. Um, but we are, what we're seeing is the rural, rural communities and the um, smaller suburban communities have come back faster than the urban or super urban. Yeah. Right? Which kind of makes sense when you think about it. You it know, does. Fewer competitors, fewer seats. You know, people want to go out and enjoy those same experiences no matter where you live. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit different. And is that a focus for you guys? Because I know for, for Royal Page Commercial, I mean, one of the big differentiators between between us and some of our competitors and where we're really starting to dominate is secondary and tertiary markets yeah. for our real estate deals. Are you guys primarily looking at more affordable real estate, the populace that may have moved out of the downtown cities, secondary tertiary markets, big, big? Yep. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, still do a little bit of infill in the urban where we are trying to reposition assets, of course. Uh, but most of our growth will be in suburban, you know, you know, not in between that suburban rural, I guess the sweet spot be between, you know, 30 and 100,000 people is kind of a spot where we saw a lot of people move, like a Collingwood, as yep. an example, yep. right? Uh, and really, uh, uh, you know, it's quite funny. Like some of our restaurants, if you look at the top 50 restaurants on a sales per week basis, right? Pre pandemic. And then during the pandemic, it was absolutely reversed. really the inverse. Yeah. yeah, it was actually really interesting. And, and what causes that? People not commuting into the core. Mm. So typically the, the core assets were the highest performers based on size of asset, general populace, tourism, et cetera. That all died and went away, right? Yeah. So those sales came down. And the, and the other, their, their counter sister stores in the areas which were you know more suburban or rural focused where people were staying at home, working from home, not commuting, just got a big lift. I know you guys are fairly dominant in power centers mm -hmm. um, where I'm from in the West End. I can think of one specifically where I, I think you have everything. You've got a, a Milestones, a Harvey's, a Swiss Chalet, a Montana's, I mean, a Kelsey's. You pretty much own that entire power center. Yeah. Uh, presumably that's, you know, by design, you guys have done that. And uh, I'll ask you about that. But then also the opposite to that, tell me what you're thinking about in terms of malls coming out of COVID. I think the, the super regional malls, like a Yorkdale, Sherway, Scarborough, will always be fine. I think there's so much you know, density around them, connected to transit hubs, which is really going to be the key driver for success, in my opinion. If you can be in a, a strong area that's going to pull a large regional draw, uh, have an asset type that people want to go to, and have some kind of transit connection with residential nearby or on site, that's the recipe for success. I think the smaller centers in the smaller communities that don't have that regional draw or something to add on to it, we'll struggle a little mm. bit. We're see, we've seen it in the US, yep. and I think we're gonna see it here too. The power centers are still gonna be a major focus for you, especially as you move into some of those secondary and tertiary markets? I think we've probably grown as much as we can in the power centers today. They're not building them mm. like they used to. Uh, the the new type of power center with you know some density added to it, some yeah. residential component, a bit different. I don't like a whole lot of power center anymore. It's more of a you know a live work play center type of idea, which is not dissimilar to the center we're in today. Exactly. But they work too, right? So we were really really lucky to benefit from a ten year power center run where Walmart was coming to Canada and really built out a, a lot of stores in a, in a short order, and we really kind of came along for that ride. And you know, the thought process there was people are coming to these centers from a convenience perspective. They're driving by us when they come to those centers. Yep. They recognize the brand. Next time you think about where I want to go to do my family, we pop in your head because you drive by us every day. Yeah. Right? It's And listen, it's definitely worked. I mean, you can see the presence. It's, it's always there. The live, work, play ones uh, got to be really attractive for you guys. I mean, presumably something like yep. the one that we're in right now today. Uh, the density's there. The families are there. They're shopping. They're eating. Do you think those are going to continue to increase? I do, I, especially in the in the bigger urban centers. Um, you know, there's definitely examples of successful, you know, urban type live work play centers all across the globe. We can look to a lot in the U.S., which is great, and a few here in Canada. Uh, Vancouver is probably the one that really was a you know precipice in Canada because of the climate, of course, yeah. a little easier to navigate. But <clears throat> yeah, I, I think there's going to be a huge, huge appetite for it. A little bit of outdoor space, a little bit of indoor space. Uh, the key is going to be mix, tenant mix, to make sure there's enough quality mix to keep people on site. They don't kind of filter out. Yeah. So when thinking about recipe, I mean, let's let's. It's like you know the Titanic. It takes a long time to turn. When you, <laughs> when you want to make a decision, whether it be a disposition of a brand or an acquisition of a brand, 
let's start, let's talk about the acquisition, but let's talk about the disposition first. What goes into the decision making of saying, you know what, maybe this brand isn't for us anymore. Somebody else might be interested. How and when would a decision like that get made? Yeah, I think, you know, it's never an easy decision. It's, you know, like sending one of your kids off out of the nest. It's a hard one to make. But I think we always look at it from a, you know, pure financial business perspective and go, are we going to continue to invest in this brand to continue to grow it or not? And I think if there's at any point in time where you have a question mark around that or decide maybe the market's changed a little bit, there's a discussion. Right? Yeah. So which which makes sense. There's you get all looked at brands over the years that have kind of come and gone because the consumer need set or desire was there at one point in time, but it's changed a little bit, right? Yeah, you have to pivot. Yeah, markets mature, brands mature. Uh, you think about you know the what I call the upscale casual category in Canada. Uh, you know they didn't really exist in Ontario or Montreal for decades. And it was really kind of an import from Vancouver with one of our brands, actually, yeah. Milestones yeah. that we bought and brought and really kind of, you know, was a spearhead for all that, all that upscale casual growth in, in Ontario. So all the, you know, the Earls and the Joeys and the Cactus yeah. stuff started to come east. Um, and it's been relatively recent. Yes, exactly. You don't have to go that far back no. to realize it, it, in my childhood that there was very few options. Absolutely. We were going out to Swiss Chalet. Yeah. I mean, it, there was very few choices. So that, that change and that development has happened relatively quickly. Yeah. And you think about, you know, consumers are looking for different things because they are talking about discerning with their money. They, they yeah. have choices to make. If you're going to make the choice to go out and, and not cook at home, you want an experience that kind of matches the payment. And, you know, brands have come and gone, like you know, Pizza Hut, Red Roofs. It used to be everywhere. You yeah. don't see them anymore. They're gone, right? There's takeout and delivery units, but that brand's changed. It's very important to us if we're going to keep a brand in our portfolio we put the right amount of attention, capital to it to make sure it's continued to be relevant in the consumer's minds. And if you don't think it can be or think there's just a change that's not going to be able to be you know, defended, it's time to have that honest conversation with yourself. Right. Uh, the honest conversation, it may or may not make the cut. Sometimes they have to go by the wayside. The flip side of that, when acquiring some of these upstarts, these brand new brands, uh, there's a bunch, as you mentioned, there's some yep. that have come into the network. There's some that are just upstarts and brand new. Uh, anything really exciting for you that you see in terms of a change? I mean, for a while it was breakfast. Everything was breakfast. There was new ones everywhere. Then yeah, and was... that's, a, that's a white space for us, too. We didn't jump on that bandwagon yet. We might. We'll see. Yeah. Um, never say never. Um, you might for, look at a breakfast play. Yeah, you never know, right? I mean, it's definitely a gap for us. We, yeah. have, we have a lot of asset. And you talk about the power center where we have you know two or three spots. It's simply lunch and dinner. We mm -hmm. don't have a breakfast offering, so it, it'd be it'd be interesting for the brand. You know, it's uh, for our company rather, not the brand, to, to look at that. It's definitely a white space we could fill. Uh, ethnic for us is is a big opportunity as well. We don't really have anything that really fits that true ethnic uh, component, and we know that you know a lot of the urban centers in Canada are changing demographically. Yep. And if we don't find a way to uh, resonate with that consumer, we may we may lose them, mm -hmm. right? They, we may not, you know, be able to convert them to one of our brands if they're just used to something else or want something else from a taste profile. Yeah, and those right? brands certainly have grown. Yeah, 100%. Um, and then for us, you know, we have, you know, there's trends we watch and, uh, you know, the tequila, tequila trend, you know, the brewery trend, all these things, um, the wine trend. We don't make sure that we're on point with a lot of these things. The tequila thing for us in Canada was a big white space and we found concept we really, really liked and thought they were doing it better than anybody and really wanted to bring them into the family, which we have. That's amazing. Yeah. And for those who don't know, which brand is that? Uh, Blanco yep. and Anejo. So we have two different ones. Obviously spins spins off the names of the tequila brand itself, the flavors itself. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Anejo is more upscale, more urban focused, a little heavier price point on the on the tequila menu offering. Uh, but all you know, tapas style, traditional Mexican fare, great for socialization, great for bigger teams, you know, shareables, great, great, great idea to bring people together, uh, way people want to, they're going out to dinner and experience it. And then Blanco is just a little bit more approachable from a cost standpoint. So mm -hmm. that'll be more of our suburban type uh, offering that reaches into those smaller communities, right? That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's a great offering, a new one for you. Obviously, a little bit outside the box for yeah. what you have within your portfolio. Um, what about some of the U.S. brands that are moving up here? Yeah, we are obviously keeping a very close eye on them. Um, you know, we're an owner, 
not a franchise e mm -hmm. so we have a number of people that you know knock on our door every single week looking for us to help them bring their brand to canada they need you know a network of real estate expertise and franchise pipeline and operational expertise and it's not what we do we we actually if we're going to do all the work we want to own it all right yeah. so uh but there's a, a couple up and comers that we're really really keeping a close eye on for sure yeah and some category disruptors as well you know there's the big names out there that you know it's uh you know, it's 30, 33, pe 33 million people in Canada. So, yeah. of course, we're going to get some attention from some of the U.S. brands, right? And you think they're going to have an easy time coming up here? No. Yeah. No. That seems they, to be the struggle as so much far. coming up here as we do down there, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. It's just different culture, different type of um, taste profiles, what we do. You know, Quebec is certainly a unique, unique market unto its own, right? So, a lot of those U.S. brands, you know, if they're coming to Canada, they always try to start in Ontario or, or B.C. typically. Um, and avoid Quebec for obvious reasons. It's mm -hmm. a, you got to kind of get a strong foothold before you you make that next you know language challenge, which is interesting. And then for us, we're we're putting our you know dipping our big toe into the U.S. as well right now, we're trying to grow our brands there. And we've you know experienced some definitely some pockets of regional uh, differences that we're learning about. Right. Yeah. So it's all about research, making sure you understand does your brand will your brand story resonate with the consumer in those markets or not. In which brands have you made that move with already? Well, we have Elephant and Castle pubs in the U.S. Yep. We have 10 kegs in the U.S. Uh, we're close to launching New York Fries in the U.S. And we had Swiss Chalet in Greater Buffalo, mm -hmm. Rochester area, and we're re-entering. Re oh, re-entering. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Hopefully yeah. it does well. Yeah, I think it will. There's a big, big loyalty and big following there. It's actually a Facebook page, Bring Swiss Back to Buffalo. It's kind of cool, right? <laughs> that so, is. It's yeah. good to know that you, that you know yeah. it exists, that, yeah. so people know that you follow that. Uh, Definitely a big loyalty. Uh, I'm going to twist your arm, but before you leave here, I'm going to try and convince you. You got to bring that Toblerone back. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Do you ever hear that? Oh, all the time. Love yeah. the festive special. Yeah. Uh, I was pretty partial to Toblerone. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people people were for sure. Yeah, it's it funny. It's great for regifting too. <laughs> it really was. No, and you yeah. talk about you talk about those memories and and just real strong, vivid yeah. memories of of you know having those those recipe moments, whatever brand you were at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you mentioned about franchisor, franchisee, being an owner. Um, I, I recently was working for a franchisor who went through some struggles and, and coming out of it and making some changes. The landscapes made some changes over the last little while. What do you think about the franchise system as a whole coming out of COVID with recessional pressures, inflational pressures, um, immigration being what it is, do you think that's that space is going to change over the next couple of years? It definitely will, for sure. I mean, you know, when the pandemic hit mm -hmm. us, you know, like a lot of franchisors, we're all sitting around the boardroom table going, okay, now what, right? What should we do? How should we approach this? How are we going to differentiate ourselves with our peers? And I think, I think recipe probably was, you know, the most out there with regards to their support for their franchise community, the people mm -hmm. that were in that family. I think the, 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 the point of real distinction is our leadership team said, we're only here today because of our, what our franchisees have done uh, across Canada for the last 130 years to get us where we are. We need to protect them and make yeah. sure they, this is a survivable event for everybody, including ourselves. Um, so we took a very bold step and actually underwrote their rent. Yeah. Uh, for a period of seven, eight months wow. during the pandemic where it was pretty tough. Yeah. Right. So they didn't, there was a worry they could take out of the equation. They just paid us a percentage of what other sales were that was predefined and didn't have to worry about it. It was this huge relief off their backs because we, what we wanted to do is let them focus on the guest, for, deliver great experiences, give back to the community, uh, you know, be a leader in your, in your industry. Um, and we didn't have a single franchisee that went down. Not one. Really? No. Wow. Testament uh, to what we were. And it, it really was, is a testament. It was big numbers. I, I don't want to gloss over that point at yeah. all because, I mean, that is a, a, a massive gesture from you guys. Uh, way to pay it forward. And that's yeah. that's really, I mean, that's industry defining. It really is. And and I guess you, uh, it bore fruit that, you you know, you didn't lose one franchisee. That's amazing. Not one. And the great part of it is coming out of the pandemic, they are strong mm. or stronger than they were in some cases going into it. Yeah. So what that means meant to us is loyal franchise based community. Uh, when we're looking to grow our brands, typically, you know, half of your annual growth comes from existing partners and half from new. 
it, it may, it's going to flip a little bit. It's probably going to be 70% from existing because we've shown them we're loyal. We've shown them we believe in them and we trust in them and they're meaningful to us. All right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it, it's, it, it goes a long way. It really does. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's again, back to your culture. It yeah. really is. And I had a franchiser was calling me going, we yeah. heard this, is this really true? I, I like, can yes. verify that 100% <laughs> that we were sitting around a table saying recipes doing what? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, congratulations. Yeah. Really, really uh, amazing story for you guys. Um, this wouldn't, uh, obviously I have to ask you about this. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about real estate. You guys have a massive real estate portfolio. Yeah. Um, you continue to presumably want to expand. You mentioned the uh, 12 brands looking to acquire more real estate, looking to make more moves. Will that be through acquisitions? Are you looking to sign more leases? Are you on the fence right now based on where the real estate market is? What, what are you guys doing? Uh, we're not, we're not on the fence with the real estate piece. Um, the only struggle honestly is, is justifying how to build. Mm. The construction costs, as everybody knows, are a little bit out of whack and out of sync right now, as is every kind of supply chain in most industries. Um, you know, so the pressures on the P and L for us when you have a higher food cost and a higher labor cost and you know, margin compression because you're, you know, you're giving some dollars to the Uber to skip and so forth. It's a little tougher, right? It's a little tougher to go. Okay, I can all those pressures and construction costs are up forty percent. Yeah, it's very difficult to you know, make that investment decision. So we're making the ones that we know are very strong and easy ones to do. And we're not necessarily looking at it from today's perspective, we have a bit of a longer term view on it. So it may not be as attractive today as it once was, mm -hmm. but we know three, four, five years from now, things will settle off and we'll be glad we made those calls. Yeah, and typically you guys are doing how long of a lease? 10 plus Ten, options. Yeah. 10 plus options. Yeah. So um, we've had landlords on here. We, we've got a bunch booked for next year. From Mark Eaton sitting here, uh, what are some of the asks that you would look to for the landlord community in the next year or so? I just think, you know, make sure you're doing deals to the right tenants that are going to have longevity to the site. And we see a lot of short-term mindset stuff happening right mm -hmm. now where yeah. fly-by-night concepts willing to pay me, you know, X dollars, so I'm going to do that deal. Okay, but there's no real long-term view on that, you know, put your stock in a long-term proven concept uh, like us that, you know, we've been around for 130 years, we're going to be around for another 130, right? And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be there, we'll do pay the, pay the bills, we'll do the right thing. And we think we have brands that really people crave and want to be come to, right? And the other thing is just tenant mix. Make sure you have a really good understanding of how your center works and make sure there's enough attractions for guests to come there. Definitely. Uh, for sure. But having yeah. sat on both sides, it's always odd to me to see that brand goes in there. doesn't really seem to fit the area. Yeah. doesn't really seem to fit the mix. And sure enough, 12, 18, 16 months later, they're, they're gone. Yeah. I understand from the landlord's perspective why you want to try that sometimes, whether it be to, to roll the dice and try and be unique. But you got to think sometimes that they know going in there, this is a failed concept. Yeah. And this is, a, you know, we're, we're already pre-leasing that space in our minds because we know they're not going to last. <laughs> for sure. Which is unfortunate. It happens. But, uh, you know, I agree with you. The long-standing brands that have been around, tried, trust, tested, true. Uh, those are the ones I think landlords want. So that, yeah. that for sure, that carries clout for Sometimes you guys. It's easy to get clouded a little bit, I think, from you know what's new and up and coming because it seems exciting and sexy and all those things. But there's also you know stock in in what's been proven, what's been around for a long time and been successful, right? Uh, I think that's really important to not forget. I know in the States, specifically uh, for the malls or for some of the power centers, they have a heavy, heavy component on entertainment mm -hmm. and attraction and bringing it there. Uh, I forget what the number was. I think John was talking to me a little bit about maybe like 40% of that. Um, do you see those areas changing in Canada where they're going to go more entertainment, make it an attraction, make it a destination that will complement the food category? Yeah, I think they I think they have to, right? I think there's there's fewer you know, type of retailers that we traditionally had in a fashion category or whatever the case may be. So you have to bring different types of, you know, retailers to centers to attract new guests, but also keep people on site longer, right? So we're looking for that too. We're looking mm -hmm. at the next new opportunity is, you know, where can we go that we're going to get, you know, a nice you know, cross section of people, but on a different, different timeline, right? Um, I think the, the malls have done a good job. If you have a theater on site or you have some cool other entertainment, whatever, it extends that dwell time. 
And for us, we look for that because if the dwell time is extended, mm -hmm. people are going to be on site longer, which means they're probably going to want to eat while they're there. All right? So there's definitely a plus for us. That's great. It, it'll benefit you, yeah, I agree, as we've well. We've always historically you know, looked for the, you know, either being on a theater site or being adjacent to a theater site. Because for us, it's a, you know, kind of a one-stop shop. Let's go to a movie and a dinner, right? Or let's go for some appetizers before the movie or drink after the movie, right? So there's a nice synergy there. So and all those other pieces of entertainment, too, can really help. Without giving any trade secrets away, is there a magic number that you guys have? You're at 12 right now. Is somebody in a secret room writing a 15, a 20, a 25? I don't think so. No. No, I think, you know, we, we have, a, we have our, our goals where we'd like to see it. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's that. I think it's, it's more, you know, you know, health of the company, mm -hmm. you know, strong strategic acquisitions or dispositions to really shape the company to make sure it's a you know, long-term uh, hold for, for our parent company. And I think our leadership team, including myself, have this inherent desire to leave this to the next generation in better state than we got it, right? That's really the goal. That is the goal. Uh, you mentioned briefly about Fairfax and about the change. For those who don't know, um, you mentioned it's exciting. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about why it's exciting and, and why the decision was made. Well, I, I think... You know, they looked at recipe as a whole coming out of the pandemic and like a lot of other, you know, food service companies, um, both Canadian and abroad, you know, undervalued from a stock market perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the hospitality industry. There's a lot of industries that Definitely. still haven't kind of bounced back. Look at all the REITs as an example. They're yep. still all undervalued um, out there. They will all come back. But I think they just saw a good opportunity to take it back, you know, you know rebuild it. And at potentially at some point in the future, there's a you know new IPO at a better time that gets gets a little bit more payback, right? So it was purely opportunistic. Opportunistic, yeah. Uh, from we've seen a few of those out there. It definitely, yeah. there there has been those opportunities. Phil was here, our CEO, talking about people on the sidelines salivating, watching for opportunities. Yeah. So that's definitely happening coming out of COVID. Uh, from a day to day perspective, any changes? Does that change anything for you? Create opportunities? Uh, make anything more difficult? I don't think it makes it anything more difficult. It's exciting because we're we're really keeping a close eye on on who the up and comers are. We're ready to pounce when the right one comes along. Uh, but from you know private perspective versus public perspective, it certainly does take a lot of the day to day stresses away with regards to reporting, dealing with the analysts, you know, the people that follow our stock. Because really, they're looking quarter over quarter. They're not looking long term. We need to look long term in this business. You know, what you do today sometimes doesn't bear fruit for a couple of years. Yeah. That's okay. Those are strategic decisions to kind of move the needle down that, that way. But sometimes the public markets are too critical of those decisions. They're very critical. Yeah. And, and much like Monday morning quarterbacks, everybody has an opinion. <laughs> yeah. Everybody <laughs> feels like they, they only look at it as a snapshot, as you said. And sometimes yeah. that's very difficult to make the right decision. So I agree with you. That tends to be um, where opportunities come from. Definitely. And the ability to make some of those moves without the eyes of uh, scrutinizing you yeah. and what you're doing should be interesting. Before we wrap up here, anything exciting you want to tell us? Anything, any tidbits you can give us in terms of what you guys are working on, what you're looking at? Not a ton. I mean, we're, we're, we just recently did the private thing kind of November, mid-November. So, and it's actually end of November. So we need a bit of time to digest that, kind of yep. refocus ourselves, uh, really focus on, you know, you know, getting the company to a really, really healthy spot which we are today, but even more strong to take, take on that new challenge, right? Um, we get calls every day and we say no a lot because we're pretty picky at what we want to do, right? Which is kind of a great spot to be in. So I, I think, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of us in the, a lot of recipe in the news over the next couple of years for sure. Uh, but it might be later, later, in the, later this year. All yeah. right. Yeah. Exciting times. Uh, iconic company, iconic brands. Really, really happy to have you here. Um, before we wrap up, Tell us a little bit. What do you do for fun? What do you like to do? <laughs> I'm a big golfer, of course. Okay. I wish I was better, but, yeah. uh, but I do love it and love travel. Did, too. did you Did you get some time over COVID? Did your game improve a little? Yeah, did improve a little. Well, thought I improved. You know, <laughs> it kind of kind of comes and goes. But uh, yeah, a little bit of time. Obviously, belonged to my local men's night and good yep. good group of guys that I typically play with. So that's been wonderful to be able to you know ramp that up a little bit. And then um, yeah, I just love to travel. I love seeing new places across the world, it's always great to do. So I always find I bring some great tidbits back, yep. some learnings, and uh, 
the best education you ever get is travel, right? Yeah, it'll be amazing. And hopefully we'll get to see you guys continue to expand yeah. on your travels. You make some yeah. more moves outside of Canada, Sorry, obviously but- inside Canada. Really, really excited about your success. Really excited about where you guys are going over the next couple of years. So we will continue to watch with bated breath. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. Really My pleasure. Thanks it. for having me. That's great. Yeah. Amazing. Always happy to talk about our company and uh, what we're doing. It's great. Well, it's exciting to hear about it. Thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Watch, subscribe. Thank you again to Mark. And uh, make sure, or at least hopefully, everybody got their festive specials over the holidays. That's right. Please do. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Okay.